Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. There are not very many jokes in the Bible, uh, but there are quite a few funny things that happen if you look closely, at least if you can kind of laugh at the absurdity of unbelief. So as today's gospel reading shows us, we have kind of one of those moments here. So our text takes place uh, near the end of Christ's public ministry. He's on his way towards Jerusalem to die for the sins of the world. So after uh, what's been going on here is Jesus has just spent three years demonstrating that he is the Messiah and all of his preaching and all of his miracles and all of his love that he pours out for the world. He proclaims himself to be the promised son of David who is going to, uh, who is going to rule from his father's throne forever by going to the cross and being the world's savior, by dying and rising again, which is why that's what he talks about uh, at the beginning of our, at the first half of our gospel text for today. So that's who Jesus is. And then as he's on his way towards Jerusalem, he comes across this blind beggar that Mark's gospel identifies by the name of Bartimaeus. And Bartimaeus cries out to Jesus for mercy and he calls him son of David, which is an indication that he knows who Jesus is. And son of David is a messianic title. He recognizes that Jesus is the savior of the world. And then the crowds that are surrounding Jesus rebuke this guy and tell him to be quiet. So I find this to be rather funny because in other words, for three years, everywhere Jesus has been going and he's just said it again right before they arrive in Jericho, for three years Jesus has been shouting, I have come to do the Messiah stuff for you guys. And then Bartimaeus cries out, I would like for you to do the Messiah stuff for me. And the crowd responds by going, be quiet. Jesus is busy doing the important stuff. Go, what do you mean the important stuff? He's doing the very thing that he came to do. So how is it that the crowd doesn't understand this? Well, the answer is quite simple. They don't understand it. They rebuke uh, Bartimaeus because they don't understand that Christ's primary purpose is to die for the sins of the world. They imagine that Jesus is still going to be building this earthly kingdom. He's going to establish this glorious empire on earth, and they imagine that because they are going to be a part of it, because they are following him, all of that glory and honor and majesty is going to rub off on them. Not only do they get to be a part of that collective, big, amazing, glorious thing, but they individually get to have the glory that comes from being the ones who are doing all of the work associated with that kingdom. In other words, they imagine that Christ is, has come in all of his work and is saying to them, I have come to make you important. And so when Bartimaeus cries out, Lord, have mercy on me, what they're essentially doing when they tell him to be quiet is looking at him and saying, hey, Jesus is busy doing the stuff where he makes us glorious and important. Don't distract him by asking him to have mercy on some unimportant, pathetic beggar like you. So pride has corrupted their understanding of Christ. And very often, pride does the very same thing to us. It corrupts our understanding of Christ, which in turn corrupts our understanding of the church. So I've been a pastor here for about a little over eight years now, and this has gotten better. But one of the things I still deal with all the time is finding out that you guys have been in the hospital or have had some serious need and I find out about it after the fact, and I say, why didn't you call me? And the response is, I didn't want to bother you because I know that you were busy. Now, why is it that people say that? Well, part of it is because you're all sweet, humble Midwesterners and you never want to impose yourself on anyone. But a big part of it is because we have been just sort of oppressed into thinking that it's not actually the job of the pastor and it's not the job of the church, first and foremost, to be about mercy and love and salvation and giving a word of comfort to the sheep who need it. I mean, just look at suburban white American Christianity, right? So when people move out to the suburbs, what churches do they join? They join the big, fantastic, amazing church that has all of the great, wonderful programs and it has the fantastic youth group that all their kids want to go to because their friends go to that church and they have a bunch of pastors at their church and who's the top pastor? What is his job? 
His job is to be the administrative pastor who runs the congregation like a CEO, and they get all these people, and if there's too many people in the church and you don't get a chance to talk to your pastor about your needs, well, go talk to your small group leader about that, or go talk to one of the junior varsity pastors who can deal with that pesky little pastoral care stuff. We're busy building the kingdom of God on earth. We don't have time to get distracted by poor, pathetic beggars like you who need a word of gospel comfort. And even if we don't belong to a church like that, this stuff is just so rich in our culture that it corrupts our thinking all the time. We simply imagine that the job of the church is to build this big, glorious kingdom, to fill our sanctuary so that people in our communities will be impressed with us and our kids and grandkids are going to want to come back to church because we're the awesome place to be. And we will gladly give our time and our money and our efforts to support anything that builds us up in that way. But we will very rarely give our time and our money and our efforts to things that don't actually accomplish that earthly glory that we want to build up. A couple years ago, I was uh, helping out in swaddling clothes, and I was talking to a young couple that I met there. Uh, They'd recently come to Illinois from Mexico, and uh, with basically just kind of the clothes on their back, and they had this little baby with them. And so I said, hey, have you had your daughter baptized yet? And they said, no. And I said, well, why not? And they said, because we can't afford it. And I said, I'm sorry, what? Uh, And what I came to find out was that apparently uh, there is a rather large problem, especially in Latin American Catholicism, of priests basically extorting money from the poor by telling them you can't get your baby baptized until you give us a sufficient amount of money. Now, the Roman Catholic Church doesn't approve of this, but culturally speaking, it's a big problem. Now, this guy and his wife and their daughter, they were not alone. There are a lot of people like that in our country, people who have come here who uh, have a lim- perhaps have a limited skill set. They have hardly any money. They're in utter poverty. They can't speak the language very well, so they have limited opportunities. And they, so they're greatly in need of their daily bread. They are profoundly in need of having Christians share the mercy of Christ and of hearing their Messiah tell them, I have come to give you the Messiah stuff by proclaiming that you are my own and I will feed you and care for you, and not only in your body but in your soul. These are folks who are profoundly in need of hearing a pastor proclaim to them that the gospel of salvation is free, that you do not need to believe the lie, that God's kingdom costs money that God expects your good works or that God expects your earthly treasures in order to pour out the love that Jesus came into this world to give you. So that's all over the place. That's the, the Hispanic immigrant community is probably the biggest mission field in this entire country. And that's been the case for pretty much most of my, all of my adult life, probably even going back further than that. And yet, uh, For the most, now, granted, I've, you know, perhaps your conversations with people have been different than mine, but I've been surrounded by church going people my entire life. And when you look at that population of people who so desperately need Jesus, do you want to know the most common thing I hear in response to their need? It's not, well, how do we figure out a way to get a pastor who can preach to them in a language that they're going to understand? It's not, how do we invite them into our congregations and make them a part of our fellowship? It's the sneering condescension of, These people need to learn English. They need to assimilate to our culture. All right, well, let's pick that thought apart for a minute. So do they need to learn English? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, So people who are coming here from Spanish-speaking countries, they should definitely learn English a lot faster than all of those German Lutherans who settled in Chicago and were still worshiping in German a hundred years later and only stopped doing it because at the outbreak of World War I, people were burning our churches down and we wanted to make sure people understood that we were loyal Americans and not sympathizers to the Kaiser. So fine, yeah, absolutely, they should learn English. But do you know what they need to do more than speak to us in English? They need to hear Jesus speak to them in Spanish in words that they understand. They need the comfort of the gospel. They need to know that the Messiah who has come to do the Messiah stuff is going to do it for them, those people in need. So why is it that we often respond with such hostility and indifference to their plight? Well, I think in the end, the answer is very simple. 
it's because that's not actually the kind of growth and glory that we want. So even if it succeeds and we fill our congregations up with a bunch of people who don't share our language or our culture, that's not going to give us the earthly glory we desire. And we don't want the church to get distracted pouring out the mercy of Jesus when we imagine that Jesus has more important things to do in giving us earthly glory. This is also true on a kind of individual level, right? So uh, if you want people to volunteer in church, uh, there's, a, there's a very simple formula for it, which is the, the, uh, the, e the quicker people are to volunteer for stuff, the more likely they are to get compliments or thank yous for what it is that they're doing, right? So uh, we don't have the practice of labor years here. I'll talk to you about that later if you want to know why that is. But uh, if you say to people, who wants to read the scripture lessons in church? And everyone raises their hand and go, okay, who wants to clean the toilets at church? No hands go up. No glory in that. We want to feel, we think that the purpose of the church is for us to get the validation that we have done the good, amazing, wonderful Christian stuff. And if we're not going to get that from people, we don't want to be bothered serving them. Uh, so let's talk for a little bit about our swaddling clothes program. So now we, we had a, a lot of folks help out yesterday. I'm very thankful for that. So for those of you who are, if you're not familiar with our swaddling clothes program, it's downstairs in the other part of the building. It's this free store that's open a couple times a month. Uh, that gives out diapers, wipes, strollers, uh, clothing, all sorts of things to young families in need. And uh, we've been doing it for a number of years, and as time has gone on, it's become a little bit more difficult to get volunteers. And I completely understand why that is. Because the reality is, it's not everyone, right? But a lot of the folks that are coming in to help out, who are coming in and using swaddling clothes, are profoundly ungrateful, entitled, obnoxious people. And there are ladies who are coming in, and you, it's very apparent from the cars that they're driving, from their, from their fingernails, from their hair, that they don't maybe really totally actually need to use the free stuff for their kids, but they're just choosing to spend their money on themselves instead of buying clothes and diapers and food for their children. Absolutely, that's 100% correct. And trust me, you are not more annoyed by that than I am. But here's the thing in all of that. They're going to do it anyways. They're going to prioritize themselves over their children anyways. And what do their kids need? Well, their kids need to know as they walk into this building that exists because we believe in Jesus Christ that we are here to share the mercy of Jesus Christ with them. Their kids need to know that even if their parents won't prioritize them, we will. That we will love them. That we will cherish them. That when they have been reduced to being beggars on the side of the road, that we will not ignore their need, but we will do exactly what it is that Jesus has set us out to do and to be the hands of the Messiah who gives the word of salvation to those who are in need. They need to grow up knowing that that's who we are so that they can trust in the word of salvation that we proclaim here. So, do they need mothers who have a better understanding of how money works? Yes, absolutely. Do they need mothers who will stop having kids with men that they're not married to? Yes, absolutely, completely. They totally need that. But do you know what they need more than your economics and family planning lessons? The gospel. Likewise, their, their mothers, their parents who come in, and, and again, this isn't everyone. I hope that everyone, you all recognize that, but it's a decent percentage. right? But these ladies who come in and complain about the free stuff that you're giving them. Do they need to be thankful? Yes. Absolutely, they need to be thankful. Should they be more appreciative? Yes, they absolutely need to be more appreciative. But do you know what the reality is in that situation? Your need to be validated, your need to be recognized for doing the good Christian kind thing is not as important as their need for Christ. And if our approach to these things is to just simply say, we don't want to be bothered Deal, giving the mercy of Jesus to people who don't appreciate it, well, my goodness, it's a good thing that Christ didn't feel that way about us when we didn't appreciate his mercy. And likewise, if we, if we want to be able to share the mercy of Christ with these poor beggars on the side of the road, 
The reality of the situation is that this is the way that we meet them. This is the way we encounter them. And if it doesn't go the way that you want, that's not the point. The point is that we share the mercy of Christ with those who need to hear it. The point is that when blind beggars are crying out for mercy on the side of the road, we don't tell them to be quiet because we imagine we have better things to do with our time and our money. So when when Jesus brings Bartimaeus to him, when he calls him to him and heals this blind man, there are really two things that are happening there. Jesus is obviously showing mercy to Bartimaeus, but he's also rebuking the crowd. He's ultimately saying to these folks, this poor blind beggar knows who I am, and you don't. This guy who can't see anything sees that I am the Messiah who has come to do the Messiah stuff for him and to give him the very salvation I came into this world to give, and you don't see it. He's not the one that's blind. You are. But at the same time, when Christ pours out his healing upon Bartimaeus, what he shows that crowd that he's just called to repentance is that Jesus is and always will be the Savior who has mercy upon the poor, blind beggars who have been utterly reduced to ruin by their sin and their pride. And he will always pour out his love and mercy upon them. In other words, we are the ones who need Christ to do the Messiah stuff. And that's precisely what it is that Jesus has come to do. So this is, in Luke's Gospel, this is the very last miracle Christ performs before the beginning of his passion, a few chapters later. And it's a very interesting end to the miracle, because usually when Jesus heals people, they get healed, and then they go off on their merry way, uh, and you go home, you know, you see that in, for example, the, the healing of the ten lepers, right? They go back to their homes. But Bartimaeus follows Christ. His eyes are opened, and he doesn't go home. He immediately is following the Savior of the world as he is about five seconds away from entering into Jerusalem and beginning his passion. Bartimaeus, his eyes are opened, and Christ opens them just in time for him to see Jesus go to the cross and be everything that he promised him that he would be. And that's ultimately what it is that Christ has done for us. So there upon the cross, we see who our Savior is. He is the one who didn't have something better to do. He's the one who isn't busying himself with more important things. He's the Savior of this world who came to be the Savior of poor, blind beggars on the side of the road. He is the one who has come to do the Messiah stuff for the people who need the Messiah stuff. And that's precisely what it is that Jesus does at the cross. From the cross, Christ's veins are opened and he pours out that Messiah blood and he washes it out upon you and he destroys and kills the pride that caused you to hate your neighbor and ignore your needs. With that very blood, he does the Messiah's work of erasing from the very mind of God all of your sins and transgressions that made you unworthy to live forever. There, as Christ breathes his last, he breathes out upon you the very mercy of God that has given you the right to live within his kingdom forever, the mercy that makes you worthy to stand beside your brother forever in heaven, to stand, uh, to stand beside your father as well and to rejoice in the love that will never be taken away from you. That's what Jesus accomplishes upon the cross, and that is why he has instituted his church. That font is there not to give glory to people who imagine they are more important than you. That font is there to give eternal glory to you by washing away your sins and covering you in the messianic love of Jesus Christ. This pulpit exists not so that you can be proud of yourself for being an amazing, loving person, and not so that you can be reduced to nothing and be ignored by those who imagine they are greater than you. This font exists so that you may know that you are, in fact, the greatest thing in the eyes of God because through the blood of Jesus Christ, you have been made his very own. This altar exists not so that you can boldly proclaim to the world that you are a good and faithful Christian, or so that the world can boldly proclaim to you that they are far more worthy and far more important in the eyes of Christ than you are. That, that altar exists so that you may know that the Savior of this world came into this world to give you his mercy, 
That altar is there so that you may kneel before it. And when you see the very body and blood of Christ, you may hear the gospel message that Jesus has been proclaiming for all time. As you stand there crying out, saying, Lord, I need the Messiah stuff. There, Jesus says to you, I have given that Messiah stuff to you. And I will never, ever stop until the end of time. Amen.